You're solo here, huh? Fine. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Make sure everybody turns their phones off. All right, the committee uh, has been gaveled in. Ms. Grumman, welcome back to the Legislative Branch Subcommittee, and congratulations on the 25th anniversary of the creation of the Office of Congressional Workplace Rights. Your mission is needed now as much as it ever has been over the last 25 years. We know the past year has been a monster year for your office as you've had to meet all the deadlines of implementing the changes to the Congressional Account Act in six months. Kudos to you and your staff who clock so many hours to meet the deadlines. We really appreciate it. I know the reforms are in the early stages of implementation, but we will be very interested in your thoughts about how it's going. As I'll be saying at all of our hearings, we have been told to expect a funding allocation this year that is a freeze of last year's allocation. That is especially unfortunate for your agency since you requested no increase last year. I'm sorry to be the bearer of that bad news, but I just want to give people a realistic picture of, of where we're starting from. Um, before you give your testimony, I'll ask Ms. Herrera Butler if she has any opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. The, this is the second time you'll have testified before the subcommittee since uh, the Congressional Accountability Act of 1995 Reform Act was signed into law, and the first uh, since the new dispute resolution process uh, was implemented. So I look forward to hearing how it's all progressed. Uh, going into CAA reforms, there were some unknowns associated with uh, what the financial costs would be for full implementation. Uh, and I hope there is now more certainty around what those costs will be um, and that they've been incorporated into your request. I understand we asked for these changes to happen really quickly, <laughs> like, like yesterday when we asked, right? Um, so thank you to you and to your staff um, for implementing these changes in such a short time frame. Uh, we appreciate your office's work in improving safety um, and this, it really the, the safety of, of the entire legislative branch, protecting the rights of employees uh, and assuring access for persons with disabilities and educating our constituency on CAA's mandate. So thank you and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. After your oral remarks, we will include your written opening statement uh, in the record. So Great. you may begin. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Ryan, Ranking Member Herrera Butler, and all our distinguished members of this committee, it's good to see everybody back again. Um, on behalf of the Office of Congressional Workplace Rights, it's a great name, thank you for giving it to us. Thank you for the opportunity to tell our story and to answer your questions on our 2021 budget justification. So when last we met, we were undergoing full implementation of the Reform Act. And while our office has been in operation since 1996, we're just barely six months under the new system, as you all say. Um, as you know, the Reform Act, and you mentioned in your statement, uh, mandated that we complete virtually all the changes within 180 days. And that really was akin to designing a brand new agency in six months. But in six months, we accomplished a great deal, and bear with me as I go through them. Um, we implemented full, following full public notice and comment and meetings with our stakeholders, new procedural rules that reflect changes brought about by the Reform Act. Normally, a process of this nature would take more than a year. It took us five months. We created new roles, position descriptions, and responsibilities, and hired and trained new staff to fill two new statutory roles in our office, the confidential advisor who's here with today, uh, Sargam Hans, and our preliminary review hearing officers. Normally, the design, recruitment, and training of these positions would take at least six months. We accomplished the same in two. We created a new e-filing system designed and implemented called Socrates, which translates into secure online claim reporting and tracking e-filing system. Uh, um, our IT manager. Oh, yes, yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> Uh, we're pretty proud of it. And normally the design, the testing, and the launch of a system like this would take years. We accomplished it in partnership with the Lab uh, Library of Congress and our vendor in four months. We launched the first ever legislative-wide workplace climate survey, which includes questions about attitudes uh, towards sexual harassment. That um, survey launched in December will be open through February. And we continued business as usual. 
uh, cases were still processed. Occupational safety, health, and public accessibility inspections continued. Labor disputes were administratively addressed, and we continue to fulfill our statutory mandate to educate and to outreach in our community on the rights and protections under the Congressional Accountability Act. And it is this role that has increased in stature by virtue of the Reform Act, because now mandatory training of every ledge branch employee by every employing office, some of which have designated us for that purpose. So privately, I have expressed our deep appreciation um, and our dedicated staff to the purpose and the mission in the last, certainly the last year. Today, let me publicly acknowledge the women and men who worked night and day during this monster period, as you say, to meet the deadline. And while time was always an issue during the 180 days, thank you for seeing that we received sufficient funding to meet the demands of that challenge. Um, Thank, uh, um, thank you for the privilege of your time. I know you have questions. Um, we hope we have answers, given the, the short period of time we've been under the system. And I look forward to talking to each one of you. Great, thank you. And thank you to your team, too. I know they're sitting behind you and they're um, back at work. They're but, but please, uh, <laughs> I thought y'all looked pretty good for all the work you put in. <laughs> um, but thank you to all of you. We appreciate it. We know we asked a lot, but obviously this is a very important issue. We mm -hmm. want to set the gold standard here in Congress, and uh, you're helping us do that, so we appreciate it. Uh, we're going to open it up. I'm going to yield to Ms. Clark for questions. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you, Director Grumman, for being here, and to all of you uh, for being here. We so appreciate the work you're doing and the incredible timeline in, in which you were given and have met. Um, it's, it's really very, very impressive. Um, but we continue to have concerns about um, instances of sexual harassment and discrimination in our congressional workplace. Mm -hmm. And I know that you are, um, are undertaking a congressional climate survey uh, to do that, and um, we receive many calls about different surveys into our office. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I found a little disconcerting was that we didn't know about this survey, my staff didn't, until we were researching for this hearing. So I wondered how you feel the outreach and education um, I think there is a general reluctance to participate in these surveys that you have to overcome. Mm -hmm. If you could tell me a little bit about your approach and how we can help you uh, get the best response rate possible. Perfect. Um, first, let me start by saying that the climate survey is a statutory creature. Right, yes. Right. yes. So um, there, under the statute, we had to do certain things. It had to be voluntary, anonymous, and confidential. It had to have questions regarding attitudes towards sexual harassment, and we had to collaborate with on methodologies and procedures with CHA, Sent Rules, and uh, Homeland Security, Government Affairs. Um, having said that, the, the survey did launch. Um, we are pinging employees every single week. The survey is actually in your mailbox right now. Um, the, it's under climate survey at ocwr.gov. Um, we have tried to reach out to chiefs of staff. We've had um, a table in the cafeteria reaching out to people on their lunch hour. Uh, you can help us out by reaching out to your chiefs of staff and the other chiefs of staffs and encouraging them to take that survey. Uh, clearly, the more responses we get, the less the margin of error and the more reflective it is of this community. What are you planning on doing with the data? Well, the according to the statute, the data results will be delivered to CHA, Senate Rules, and Homeland Security. We are hoping that something will come out of that survey to tie into the other side of your question that we can mine to develop new modules. Because if you've seen the survey, there'll be questions about supervisors. How did supervisors handle this type of complaint? Um, did they address it immediately? Um, so there is an opportunity, if we find a weakness in that area, to develop modules for them. Um, certainly we know we're going to have to develop a, a new module for the paid parental leave that is now, um, mm -hmm. now law, and we can talk a little bit about that. But we'll keep pinging. 
We need your help. Okay. Okay. Do I have time for another yeah, question? Yeah. Um, with the secure e-filing uh, case management system, uh, are what ongoing costs do you anticipate for maintaining that system? So far, we've spent uh, $500,000 to date. Um, that system, let me just talk a little bit about Socrates. It's more than an e-filing system. It is a file sharing system, and that's required by statute that the parties have access to during the pendency of their procedures. We also use Socrates to fulfill our statutory requirement to file reports to Congress. So it is a very uh, vast system. What we would like to do is rebuild Socrates from the ground up. We know that cybersecurity wars rage. We know hackers are getting smarter. And in order to stay secure, we need to rebuild the system. So that would be at least another $500,000. Okay. Okay. Great. And finally, um, with the um, ADR program. Yes, ma'am. Uh, that went into effect in June. Uh, we know this is a significant departure from pre-reform act. I just wondered if you could give us an update um, uh, as you implement um, any significant developments as the number of cases increased, as participant satisfaction increased, just any sort of general update on that process. Right, definitely. Um, let me just uh, preview my re remarks, and I've said this uh, in our statement, but we have to this date yet to take a case from the beginning of the process through adjudication to the final decision. So we're still six months into a new process. It is entirely different, as you say, from the yeah. old process. But in that six months, we can make a couple of generalized statements. Um, the first being, and this is not uh, new, costs, adjudication costs have gone up, um, as we expected. And that may be partially due to the preliminary review that occurs within the first 30 days of the process. And as you know, that review is a seven-point review to determine whether the claim can proceed through the administrative process. We also have um, new employing offices under our jurisdiction. We also know that the library joined us in March of 2017, and they are, to, the, to this day, the second employing office with the most number of claims. Looking forward, we know that we'll, there'll be other um, employing offices, new categories of employees like unpaid staff. The second trend is not necessarily new. Um, race, national origin, and color are consistently the largest number of claims that we receive. And that's under the old system. It's been throughout the old process, and that's current under the new system as well. What we have seen in the last year is an increase in age discrimination cases, um, almost double from the previous year. We also see in the new cases, in the new claims specifically, more retaliation ca cases than we have seen in the past. So, but let me bear in mind that uh, an allegation made is not necessarily an allegation found, and we're still exploring this process as we grow into it. Great, thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, what you said 500000 you thought it would yes. cost an ad additional. Yes. Um, you are developing this system from scratch? Yes. And so, yes. tell us your thinking on uh, between getting, you know, right off the shelf technology and building the thing from scratch, and just share with us your thinking on that. Sure. Um, the reason why we used existing commercial software is because of the 180-day deadline. There was just no way to build something from scratch. Now, with implementation behind us, we have a little time to build it and to create it and to put all the bells and whistles that we would like to in it. Um, the 180 days, as we everybody's noted, is not ideal, but in order to meet that deadline, that's what we had to do. And so you can't take it to the next level with the bells and whistles using the commercial off the shelf? Uh, currently, the system is maintained through patches, which would, through the Library of Congress. And that is costly. That takes us offline on occasion. We can't necessarily control it. Uh, we would like to get to the point that we can, that it is our system. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's what it's going to take. Ms. Rare Butler. Thank you. Um, 
it's hard to wrap my mind around, but <laughs> I keep, keep gasping just because this is a lot here. Um, I did want to ask about FMLA. Yes. Um, I know uh, the NDA amended it, uh, the CAA, to extend paid parental leave to legislative employees. Um, what, it, what is your role in the implementation of that new legislation? So I remember our conversation last year, and there was a great deal of discussion on this, particularly the inconsistency mm -hmm. between the offices. Well, you fixed all of that through the NDA by amending our act. And as you say, um, for the first time, legislative employees are authorized paid, not unpaid, but paid parental leave in connection with the birth or the placement of a child after October 2020. So it's very bold. And after, for th after, this goes into effect after October. It's in effect now, but it's for parental, paid parental leave requests that come after October 1st, 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and to, to, to add on to that, for the first time ever, employees who have not worked the entire 12 months, the preceding 12 months, are now entitled to this benefit. So it's enormous. Um, we have some simple FAQs on our website. I can mm -hmm. see a mm -hmm. module coming out of this mm -hmm. because there's so many questions about it. Yeah. Um, and that would be our outreach and uh, mandate that we were fulfilling. But we have a statutory mandate as well. And that is we must develop substantive rules to further flesh out this law. And we will be doing it through public notice and comment with our stakeholders. And once we adopt those rules, then you have a role in that in that you must pass this mm -hmm. legislation into law. Now, there's a little bit of urgency here. It's not the 180-day kind of urgency. But if you are planning on having a child or planning to adopt a child and after October 2020, chances are you're going to know soon or you're going to know now. Mm -hmm. So that leave, may be, that leave request may be coming fairly quickly. OK. Um, uh, I wanted to ask a clarification uh, with regard to the new, in skipping back to where we were right before me, um, the new incidents of, or what you're seeing an uptake in, uh, uptick in terms of the types of claims being filed. And it was before we talked about retaliation, discrimination, and age, age discrimination. It was race. What was, what was right before that? Race, color, and national origin. And that's you're seeing the most That's consistent cases. through the years. Yes, yes. Those are the types of claims that we generally see. Discrimination based on? Yes. Wow. Has it been historically that, or is that newer? Yes. That's always been what mm -hmm. it is. And you'd say that's the highest percentage? No, it, it's usually the vast majority of our cases. What's interesting this last year, again, you know, there are changes that, you know, fluctuations throughout, but there is um, a drop in claims based on gender and sex. So it's working. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, on the survey, so I got mine this week, and I started to open it, and then I stopped. Uh, it's over 150 questions. Mm -hmm. Is that required? Because I know there were certain things we required you do. The, CH, the statute required that we consult with CHA rules and Homeland Security. So they wanted to get it right, and they developed a good deal of content based on our initial draft. So it has to be 150 questions? It does not have to be 150 questions. Just wonder that that's going to be part of the inhibition people have about open starting it. Well, it, it is depending on, and the way the survey works is it branches out. If you say no, then you skip to the next section. You say yes, and there's a series of other questions. Mm -hmm. um, I really believe that the committees wanted to be detailed and they wanted to get it right in terms of asking the right types of questions and getting the right type of information that they're looking for. The only concern I have is you're going to end up self, so the only one who's going to really go through that whole process are people who are self-selecting, or like, okay, I'm just, I'm conjecture, but, mm -hmm. so I've got a, I've got something I need to say here, I've got a problem, so I'm going to get in and I'm going to do the whole 150 questions, mm -hmm. whereas it's like I'm thinking about some of the folks in my office, and yes, I'm going to ask my chief to make sure that everybody, we highlight it. Um, do I think they're all going to do it? <laughs> I don't know. You can ask. And we want to have a good sample size. I mean, yep. it really all comes down to sample size. So mm -hmm. anyway, thank you. Yield back. Is there, is, there some, is there something you can do to incentivize people filling it out? I mean, I, mean, I know a lot of these... Uh, 
surveys you get, and I'll give you a five dollar Dunkin' yeah. Donut yeah. card yeah. or whatever, and people yeah. will yeah. Take, the, take the time to do it. Yeah. Um, I want to say yes, but realize the statute requires that it be anonymous and confidential. So there are limits. I mean, we, the, uh, what we've done is we've had e-posters. We, uh, dear colleague letters are out there. Mm -hmm. um, just get the word out. I mean, our, our slogan is simple. Just take the survey. We will come to your offices and talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, but it still has to be anonymous and confidential. Did we send out one? To, I know we talked last year about uh, sending out, maybe you and I sending out a dear colleague, a dear colleague just to. We haven't, but we don't maybe we should do that. We can do that. Yeah, okay. please. That will help us. Yeah, mm -hmm. we can do that. Uh, Mr. Newhouse, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just looking because I didn't think I had gotten one, but here it is. It's on Monday, so I guess I better <laughs> look closer at my emails. Well, uh, welcome, Director Grumman, and welcome to all of your team. Appreciate you being here with us. Um, important stuff, and I'm, I'm very impressed that you were able to get things put together so quickly. Um, I had a question about that just uh, at some point. Uh, certainly you guys just didn't huddle and say, okay, let's do this. You must have found some outside models or things to look for for resources in order to put things together, I'm assuming. but. Uh, I don't want to take my whole time asking about that, but I, I'm guessing that, that there were some, I hope there's some things in the industry or other governments that we were able to utilize. With the e-filing, uh, we consulted a couple executive branch agencies like DHS and MSPB. They have similar intake e-filing systems with that interface with the public. So they you know, <clears throat> created some ideas for us. We work closely with the Library of Congress who hosts yeah, the system. You said that. Um, and we had a vendor who designed software to go along with it. Um, it's all lessons learned. Uh, we were learning some of them as we went. It's evolving, you're yes, saying. Yes, it yeah. is. Well, right now the system is, it, you know, invite us over, we will show you what it looks like and play with it a little bit. It's very, very detailed because the claim form itself has to, um, it has to survive scrutiny from preliminary review. Mm -hmm. So it asks a series of questions that will allow our preliminary review hearing officer to determine that seven-point review that's part of... Um, so it's kind of a, a litmus test to make sure it's... In, in a manner of speaking, yes, okay. you can say that. So I, I, when we had the benefit of talking a little bit before the hearing started, so I appreciated that. Um, but I, my question I th related to you, I wanted to ask you about <clears throat> uh, the mandatory training that's required uh, for all members and staff, and I'm assuming your staff as well, yes. uh, which would be ironic if it wasn't right. But, um, but you <laughs> no. also, you guys have come up with non-mandatory training that's available. So Correct. Um, I guess I wanted to, I, what's the difference? And are we, you know, looking as a conservative Republican, you know, fiscally and all that, why do we need two things? Shouldn't we be focused on getting the best return on our investment here? Uh, and frankly, as we talked about before, uh, although it may be improving, um, I, I wasn't certain that the mandatory training was really as effective and as time well spent as it could have been. I think I think we're losing an opportunity here on, on a very important topic, so I'm very interested in what you guys have come up yourself. Understand. Um, just, just to be clear that the mandatory training for the House of Representatives is not our training. But, right, I understand. Right. It's an outside contract. It's an outside contract. That's why I can throw rocks at it, because yeah. it's not. <laughs> <easy>. <laughs> um, what we now know is we no longer live in a time where it suffices to train on the mere letter of the law. In order for that true change to occur in this community, I think, which all the legislation people have demanded, we must edu edu educate on the underlying biases, practices, and behaviors that could cause uh, discrimination, that okay. could create a hostile work. Makes exactly. Sense. And for those reasons, we've reached into preventative tools. For instance, our bystander intervention tool, which talks about what bystanders should do or say when they witness behavior. And, and our unconscious bias module, they're all in person that we deliver. Those are pre preventative tools to think about what you're saying. Not that what you're doing is necessarily wrong, but think about whether your actions or your perceptions 
are truly what this climate demands. We're not condemning anyone. It is an interactive module. Um, it is, from our reviews, uh, from the reviews that we've seen, a lot of fun. Um, and so that's the next generation. We want to be able to go further into that level. I've not heard that description on the, manda say, on the mandatory. <laughs> thing, <laughs> just saying, but, so um, uh, that, that's, that's great. I'm excited to. And I, I do think that um, if we're going to be effective here, we have to have something that people think, feel as though they're investing their time in a good way, mm -hmm. or else you're just people turn off. And I, I'm probably exposing my own, what I do. but. I'm trying to be as open-minded as possible when I go into the training, but I tell you what, it's not easy. So, so thank you for all of your efforts there. Um, you were talking about the, I think I heard you, that the race discrimination claims are going down. They're up. They're that, up. That, that, that's consistent. Well, gender's going down. Gen gender's actually gone down that's, this year. So okay. that's a good thing, right? That is a good, well. So does that reflect on the training already? It could. Maybe, or? It could. It could reflect on the mandatory training. <laughs> It could be as simple as that poster that you now require that employees be aware of their rights in this community. It's now a mandatory poster. Um, it's, we view it as good news that the reforms you put in place are working. Um, in terms of the future, I mean, we, we've talked a little bit about the climate survey. The climate survey is a wonderful tool, or could be a wonderful tool for us to mine for areas where we think that there are new areas we should explore. So it could be, and I don't know if it's a bad thing, but we could see an increase in claims, potentially, as people understand that, well, there's a resource available to me. I, and there's a more bigger awareness of, hey, this shouldn't, that, that shouldn't be, I sh I, and there's something that I can do. Right, so in, in our history, and this is pre-reform, post-reform, there have been fluctuations in caseload. We really can't attribute them to anything. Okay. Um, there okay. was a slight increase in um, claims based, cases based on gender in 2018 that's dropped in 2019. Okay, okay. Well, um, well, anyway, I appreciate your... Uh, your work on this, it's awesome and very um, great work on everybody's part for uh, you being able to work in such a close, short time frame to get things up and running. And uh, uh, it's important stuff to have a safe workplace. So thank great. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, so the GAO uh, last December issued a report um, required by the Reform Act to assess OCWR's management practices in the implementing the Act. And the report was generally favorable uh, in your response to the statutory requirement. How have you responded to the GAO's report findings on executive actions on management issues? That's interesting because um, the GAO, as you know, said we did a number of things right, which, which is to manage the changes to the Administrative Dispute Resolution Program. We did that through promulgation of rules uh, to appoint a confidential advisor. Um, and hers is more than an appointment. It has some specific statutory requirements. She is a statutory uh, being. And of course, to develop Socrates. Now, what GAO found that we uh, need to work towards is a permanent record retention program. Um, our office has a permanent record retention policy. We've had one pre-reform going back to at least 19, 20, 2016, um, and that complies with the statute. What we're moving towards is a program which now identifies risks and manages those risks, and we do that by looking at the document, finding out who has access to that document and what period of time. Now, the other GAO recommendations, there's kind of a little bit of an interrelationship between all of them. Um, one of them is to um, to develop um, a schedule of tasks, IT cat tasks. And for that, we have a current vacancy announcement out for an IT program manager. That is also tied to folding our IT planning into our strategic plan, which is tied into another GAO recommendation that we uh, d identify performance results and performance measures in our strategic plan. And now it's time with reform behind us, because our strategic plan really looked at implementation. Now we've got that behind us. Mm -hmm. Now's the time to refresh. Now's the time midterm to look at how our changing work environment has 
affected the way we measure our own success. Mm -hmm. um, one of the questions I had, which fits in here, is about the satisfaction, user satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you just said that you're going to try to really be able to kind of get that information. What, what's yeah. your sense now as to the user satisfaction? It's too new. We're still six months into the system. There have only, I think our um, statement says this, there are only 20 claims so far. Mm -hmm. We had 65 total, um, uh, 65 under the old system under 2019, so it really is too early to tell. Mm -hmm. um, I think, and this is just a, um, a thought at this point, again, because it's too early, the system is moving faster than it used to work before. Because before you had the request for counseling, 30 days, mandatory mediation, mm -hmm. 30 days, cooling off period, 30 days. Mm -hmm. Now from the day you file, you can either go in co to court right away or you're right into the adjudication process, which is the pre preliminary review. And so uh, in the context of the reporting of payments by member offices for workplace claims, we know that, um, that we did try to speed it up, but also the public reporting piece of the claims um, we understand that the first report has just been released, but it's surprising that the report doesn't report any payments for either the House or the Senate employing offices. Is that a question of timing? That is a question of timing. Um, the reporting, this, this is just one record, uh, new reporting requirement that we have, um, and it is to enhance transparency in the system, which was demanded. But under the statute, um, reimbursement only applies to awards and settlements in connection with certain types of claims filed on or after the effective date, and that being uh, June 19th. So in the first seven months of our existence, there's nothing to report. Now, there will be a second report coming out uh, January 31st of next year, which will cover the entire year of 2020. Again, a footnote, we have yet to take a case from initial processing um, through the filing of the claim through adjudication to a, to a decision. So there is nothing to report at this time. Okay. Um, well, we had the conversation earlier about the um, paid leave. Is that a 12 month or six month? It's uh, 12 weeks. Or weeks, I'm 12 sorry. Week, 12 months, wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no. Um, it's, it's 12 weeks. Of, <laughs> it's 12 weeks of paid parental leave. Okay. Um, I have a couple more questions, but do you, no, does anyone ahead. else have any? Go ahead. Just, 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 just occurred to me, uh, in these cases, uh, who's the judge or the jury or who, who decides? <laughs> the, you know, is, is it you guys or is there an independent panel? Yeah, well, it's actually a hearing officer. and the, one, one person? No, it's several. It's oh. several. Because the statute requires that this individual, the hearing officer, be appointed randomly and rotationally. Um, and that per the, this person be either a, a retired judge or arbitrator with experience in the okay. types of cases that we have. One person per case. Though. One person per case, yeah. correct. Okay. Except under the new system, there are now two judges. There is the preliminary, preliminary review hearing officer, and the merits hearing officer is actually a different person under, sta under the statute. Okay. Um, a couple questions that are off of the nuts and bolts of what we've been talking about. One is, um, you know, if you've paid any attention to the hearings we've been having over the last um, couple of years, we're talking more and more about the health and wellness of our staffs, our employees, and given what you all have been through in the last uh, year, as I said, they, they yeah. look good, but sometimes that could be deceiving yeah. on how we feel. Yeah. Um, what kills, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Well, yeah, yeah. you know, there's, there's that too. Um, is there anything that you're doing uh, along the lines of, of health and wellness? We started the House Wellness Center, and we want to make sure that that's uh, available to everybody on Capitol Hill. Mm. Um, are you guys doing anything along those uh, lines? Frankly, there hasn't been time. Yeah. Even though the, the, the classic yeah, answer. Well, the, even though the reform I don't have time to relax. Yes. <laughs> it's aspirational. Let's yeah. put it that way. Yeah. Um, even though the Reform Act has passed, it's still as busy as ever in this office, uh, in our office. Um, new employing offices are coming to us. People are reaching out for 
advice, technical advice on the new legislation. Certainly the paid parental leave is a great area of interest right now. Um, and we're grateful that they're reaching out to us, but it's always something all the time. Hopefully we'll, we'll be able to take a break. Um, we did have a wonderful lunch on the 19th of June to celebrate <laughs> the end of what we thought was the Three end. Three martini lunch. No, not really. <laughs> it, was, it was down the street, sushi. sushi. Um, but not realizing that it, 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 we, this is our new normal. This is the world we live in right now. We just have to adjust. Yeah. Mm. Well, we want to make sure everyone's functioning at peak performance, and and that includes taking care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And so we would encourage you to look at what we're doing within the House Wellness How we doing? Center. <laughs> <laughs> the public statement and the private statement are yeah. probably two different ones. Yeah. Um, the other issue, you know, we've been talking a lot about is uh, child care. And we talked, you know, we had the Capitol Police in here mm -hmm. yesterday. We've had private meetings with, um, you know, different uh, aspects of the legislative branch. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the issues for us is really competing with the private sector mm -hmm. and retention. And, and part of that is try to, trying to provide some services in an environment that obviously it's a, a lot of this stuff is mission-based, mm -hmm. which you all experienced over the last year or so that this is important work and people want to be here but you also have to provide some level of support for them uh, is there do you have any information around uh, child care needs for people that you're working with and if you don't i mean it's fine if you could maybe start exploring that because yeah. we're, we're trying to take a more of a holistic approach one of the tools mm -hmm. that's worked well in our office particularly with uh, employees who have younger children is telework yeah. So um, it, it can't be all the time, but certainly we want to encourage um, our mothers and fathers of young children to take as much time as they need and be comfortable in that environment. And that flexibility, I think, gives them the, um, the joy and the inclination to stay. As you can see, we have very liberal policies here <laughs> in the committee. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, I've covered all the ground I want to cover. Do you, I'm all you have set. Any, Thank you any so other much. Questions? What's your son's name? What's your name? Ethan. Ethan. Ethan's on the record Ethan. now. Ethan. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ethan, do you have any questions you want to ask? He was very curious about the colors and when it you know, started beeping red, and he's like, they're not, stop, they're not stopping. They're not stopping. <laughs> <laughs> you give him the gavel one time, he wants yeah. to start running the show yeah. here. <laughs> Welcome to Congress. You're going to be a good one, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Again, please pass along to everybody how much we appreciate your work, yeah. and we're here to help you and support you. We will send out, uh, yeah. either Ms. Herrera Butler and I will send out a dear colleague about the, you know, filling out the... Um, wonderful. Yeah. 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 Um, but thank you. Great. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for all the great work. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Ooh.